Hello, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Improving Behavioral Safety Within Your Lockout Program, sponsored by Brady Corporation. My name is Kyle Morrison. I'm the Senior Associate Editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I'll be moderating today's session. Thank you for joining us. We'll start the presentation in a few minutes, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. The views of the speaker and his organization are his own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Mention of any commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the magazine or the council endorse them. At the, at the end of today's webcast, we'll have a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, then click the Submit Question button. You can feel free to ask your question at any point during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the Q&A session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, but due to the large number of participants today, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. However, all unanswered questions will be forwarded on to today's speaker. For basic troubleshooting information, please click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete an evaluation survey, and I'll talk a little bit more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live presentation. To view this presentation again, and a library of all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, I think we're ready to begin. Our speaker today is Scott Stone. Scott is the Brady Safety Software and Services Solution Owner and has 15 years of experience as a safety professional building safety management systems and inspection auditing processes. Scott? Thanks, Kyle, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, and thanks for listening in. Uh, when I was asked to do this, this webinar, I was, uh, I was definitely very excited because behavior safety is so critical, such a critical component when we talk about a successful lockout program. You know, with having the employee buy-in, their full understanding, uh, their full commitment, and, and this is throughout all levels of an organization. During my time as a safety pra practitioner, I've experienced lockout programs with, with great buy-in, great employee engagement, and very high level of commitment. And then I've also experienced ones and been part of them that, that don't have that buy-in and, and that commitment. And the differences here are, are very significant. Okay, the agenda for today, um, I'm going to let me get back. All right, uh, talk about the top top four most common safety challenges within uh, within lockout programs. And this is this is from my perspective and my experiences. Many of you will have the, the same perspective and experiences, but some of you might have a have a bit different. I'm also going to talk about how to measure and evaluate behavior safety around lockout. This includes finding your current state so you can improve from there. Um, so you, you have to know where your current state is to, to base your improvements on that. And then also, you know, it has to go beyond compliance. So we're definitely going to uh, talk about that a little bit. And then best practices uh, to wrap it up for improving your behavior-based safety in your, in your lockout program. But first, uh, I'd like to walk you through a, a, a quick story. Um, again, a story many of you might find familiar um, you know, with your, with your own experience. So meet, meet John. Uh, John's a safety director for uh, a large company. He's new to the company, company and recently created a world-class lockout program. Uh, th this included training, machine-specific procedures, uh, you know, all the lockout stations, including your shift change procedures, lock removal, all those things that, that need to be implemented to have a successful lockout program. So he did his due diligence, you know, and performed a, a, a gap analysis, some type of analysis to, to get that baseline, that current state, so he can build, uh, so he could build that plan. Um, you know, he's confident he has everything in place uh, to keep his facility compliant. So he did his job, right? He has all the tools that, you know, are in place for a successful lockout program. Now meet Brandon. Brandon is one of the company's newest machine operators. Brandon just began his position three months ago, so he's still very green, very new to the environment, very new to the processes and procedures. He underwent all the necessary training and feels he has a good understanding of how to protect himself against hazardous energy when we talk about lockout, tagout. So everything was covered with him, so he knows how to do his job safely and compliant 
with the company's lockout program and their processes. So is Brandon doing the right thing? He thought he was. So Brandon, Brandon started performing his, uh, his maintenance, ta maintenance tasks when the, some of his coworkers asked him, Brandon, why is it taking so long for you to lock out this piece of equipment? He responded, well, I, I'm referring to the procedure, and this is, says this is the way I'm supposed to do it. This is the way I was trained to do it. His coworkers have worked at the company for over 20 years, uh, so they're more senior than Brandon. And they tell him he'll be fine if he only performs step one of the procedure. From their standpoint, there's no need, you know, to do all the, the other steps because it was wasted work. It took too long. You know, they've done it this way for many, many years. They've done it this way a thousand times. That might sound, that might sound familiar, um, you know, to you out there on, on the call. Nothing's happened before. Everything is fine. You know, peer pressure is very powerful, and new employees can easily assimilate to these practices. So Brandon definitely wants to be part of the company culture. He doesn't want to make anyone angry. Later that day, as he tries to perform routine maintenance on the machine, it starts up on him unexpectedly because he did not properly lock it out per the procedure, per his training that he received, per the program that was written uh, by, the, by the safety manager. So where was the breakdown? You know, why did this happen? There are a lot of things at play here. Uh, a company can have all the program elements in place. You know, we call these the tools for lockout, tag out, uh, the, the program, the devices, the locks, the tags, the procedures. But if it's not being followed, you know, and, and employees are performing at-risk behavior, you know, it's taking place because of some type of external pressure, you're setting yourself up for, for disastrous results. You know, we're going, to, we're going to get into some common safety challenges that cause someone like Brandon and his coworkers to take shortcuts and to, you know, accept some level of, of at-risk behaviors to, to gain, uh, you know, to gain something, um, meaning, you know, by skipping a step, by not fully locking out a, a piece of equipment, you know, performing that at-risk behavior, you know, results in a reduction in downtime or more product can go out the door. You know, they're, they're getting some gains uh, by performing that at-risk behavior. So nothing has happened before, so everything is okay. You know, and, and that, that, can become, that can make it become an accepted behavior just because, uh, you know, you become complacent. We're going to talk about that a little bit. It can easily become accepted just because nothing has happened before. In this scenario, Brandon was pressured by his coworkers, but the reasons for this pressure probably go a lot deeper in the organization than just those those frontline workers, those other workers that uh, that Brandon that Brandon was working with, and we'll get into some of those reasons also. Okay, so I'm going to talk about four common behavioral challenges with lockout programs. Uh, yours might be you know a little bit different than mine, like I said at the beginning, but these challenges exist to one degree or another in the majority of industry and, and businesses, and, and we've all come across these at, at some point in, in our career. The first one up there, we've always uh, done it this way. You know, I haven't been hurt yet, so it must be okay. I've done it a thousand times. I've done it for years. So how can you tell me that this is, uh, you know, this is a, an at-risk behavior? How can you tell me this is the wrong way to do it? We're going to get into that. Number two, safety, you know, uh, safety is not my responsibility. I'm not responsible for safety. You know, safety is everyone's responsibility, and they can easily try to push it off to say safety, you know, it's the safety part department's problem. That's not my problem. The third one up there, you know, we don't, uh, we don't have the time. It takes too long to do it the right way. How do you expect us to make any money? Uh, how do you expect uh, me to, to get all my work orders done in a timely manner? You know, the, it's, it's impossible. It takes too long. There's no way we can follow all those safety procedures. And the last one up there, I don't understand our program uh, requirements. You know, this comes from unaware of the program elements. This could be for a variety of reasons. Uh, it could be lack of a formal program, just don't have a, a lockout program. could be a reason for uh, that, that lack of understanding. Inadequate training we're going to get into. That's a big one, training that's not specific, that's very generic. Uh, online uh, training that's just very, very generic or handing someone a, a PowerPoint slide deck without that having, having that communication 
uh, two-way communication with those employees, and too many gray areas that aren't adequately adequately addressed. Um, you know, this is a big one where you get a lot of misunderstandings out there, and uh, so we're going to talk about some of those gray areas and uh, and how to handle them and, and really how to get the employees involved with addressing and participating in uh, in, in developing solutions to to cover some of those those gray areas. All right, so before I before I get into this slide, uh, we, we went through the the little scenario at the beginning. I'm going to refer back to that, but I also want to tell you a story from from personal experience. Kind of the you know we've always done it this way thing. Um, when I was a uh, a, uh, a safety manager for an outsourced process maintenance company, um, a couple of young maintenance technicians were involved in a very significant, um, actually a life ending um, event. Uh, our company, we perform maintenance, um, like I said, outsource uh, maintenance, and we were performing this for one company, and our company took care of uh, kind of one half of, of, uh, of the maintenance, and the, the customer still, still did maintenance on the other half, and it was kind of the, we had the legacy side, and they had the, the newer equipment that was, uh, that was still under warranty. Anyway, I was conducting some third shift training, not at that site, at a different site, and I, I just got back to the hotel parking lot at 3 a.m. in the morning when I got a phone call from an area manager. And being in the uh, safety profession, being a safety manager, you normally don't like your phone ringing uh, in the middle of the night. Normally, uh, normally not a good thing. Um, so I got the phone call. He, he said, "Hey Scott, uh, there was a there was a fatality uh, fatality at uh, at this at this location." I said, "My God, you know what what happened?" Um, well. These two technicians, or the, the customer technicians, but the the all the maintenance techs at this uh, facility were like family. They all knew each other, um, you know, a very very close knit uh, group there. But two technicians uh, were working on an injection molding machine. These employees were in their lower 30s, you know, and they were lifelong best friends. Um, they knew each other their entire lives. You know, the the job um, that they were working on. They were about done with the job. Again, it was on an injection molding machine. They were about done with the job. One of the friends left. It was on third shift. Left to go back to the the tool crib. Took some tools back, and uh, and returned um, to the job. When he came back to the job, he was unaware that his best friend had went back into that injection molding machine into the die area. And when he came back, he proceeded to hit the start button. And uh, and killed his best friend instantly uh, because he was in the in the die area and he was not aware of that. The equipment was was never locked out um, the the entire time. Um, and you know why why would they need to lock it out? And you know thinking about them, they they've done it that way for a long time. They were they were the only ones around. They knew each other's every move. You know nothing can happen to them, right? Nothing can happen to them. They've been doing it. They know each other. They're the only ones uh, working on that piece of equipment. They're the only ones that are around. Nothing can happen, right? Wrong. It can, and it did happen. It, it only takes a fraction of a second for a life to change forever or to come to an end. Uh, you know, it could have been prevented. Could it have been prevented? You know, absolutely. And the impact that something like that has on a community, um, you know, and the and the and the the customer and our employees and families was absolutely, absolutely tremendous. Um, so it can it can happen. So you know, employee risk tolerance is, is is one of the things. But you know, we, we've always done it this way. You know, is I've heard it so many times in, in my career. And just because it's always been done that way does not mean it's the right way. Sometimes this type of mentality can be hard to change because it's been accepted as okay for a period of time, but it shouldn't take a significant event to take a, a deep look at your process to try and identify gaps proactively in your program. You know, when it becomes accepted, it gets passed down to the new employees, as it did with Brandon uh, from the case study that, uh, that we talked about early on. Um, every person has a different level of risk they're willing to take, to get a desired result. Uh, that, that, that result might be a job done faster or an attaboy from supervision. Um, you know, that leads into praising the wrong behavior. When times are tough, you know, when the machine's down, 
that go-to person that you know can get the equipment back up and running. Sometimes a blind eye can be turned because of, because of what's at stake. Uh, accepting at-risk behavior in these, in these situations, it, it reinforces it, but it, it can become so easy that, my God, this machine is down. We have to get it up. Go get it. Get it done. And, you know, you kind of turn a blind eye. Hey, they got it up and going in record time. You know, but how did they do that? You know, did they, did they, did they skip anything? Did they follow all the safety practices? Um, you know, and the answer is no. Um, it becomes, you know, very hard to start to change that behavior because it becomes accepted and it becomes reinforced. Um, the third one up there, you know, what do your employees do when, when no one's looking? This is a big, uh, big indicator that shows how bought in the workforce is. You know, you need to know what's happening on the off shifts. You need to know what's happening, uh, you know, when you're not around, um, when, when you're in the office, uh, when supervision or management's not around. What's going on out there? Um, and, and that's really going to give you a good gauge on how bought in they are uh, with the lockout program. If safety goes out the window when supervision or safety isn't around, um, you've definitely got problems. And then the, the last one there, complacency. Complacency is one of the biggest risks I, I, I see out in industry. I reviewed many lockout programs. I've been involved in many different types of lockout programs, and I've seen significant gaps in at-risk behaviors you know, that definitely become accepted. But everything is perceived as, as, as okay because no one's gotten hurt. There hasn't been any citations, so everything is fine, right? Uh, you could have at-risk behaviors happening and just don't know it. Uh, I don't know about you, um, but I do not want to, uh, you know, put my safety or the safety of uh, those around me, uh, my coworkers or my family, uh, to luck. You know, there's a word for that when we talk about complacency, and that word is it's luck. It's lucky. Because, uh, again, it only takes one time. It takes a fraction of a second for a life to change forever or to come to an end. The second one, uh, safety uh, is, is not, my re not, my, uh, not my responsibility. The, the best way to uh, disengage an employee is to develop your program in a bubble. Uh, you know, behind closed doors with no employee involvement. I've, I've recently been to, uh, you know, a few um, companies doing train-the-trainer and, and, and lockout training, and the biggest complaint or the biggest um, reason that I get from employees on why they might not be following, you know, the company's processes and procedures is because they're not involved in it. You know, they say, this, this won't work because they didn't gather our voice. They didn't ask us. Um, you know, you know, what is the right way to do this? Uh, you know, hey, they're doing it in an office and they're just pushing it down our throats. Um, you're not going to get good buy-in that way. There's no better, uh, better help, you know, for creating programs than those frontline employees. Talk about lockout, tagout. It's those authorized employees. They're living it every day and, uh, and know what works and what doesn't. But, again, it's very common for the development to happen um, in that bubble without gathering the most important voice and, uh, you know, that voice is the, the authorized workforce. Management, not, uh, not participating, you know, unsure of the program elements or not aware of what's really happening out on the floor, um, that's a big one. You know, they might know what the, the book says or, the, you know, the written program, but they don't understand what's, what's really going on um, out there. And, and management, supervision, they need to know just as much as those frontline, more than those frontline authorized employees um, you know, so they can participate and then and understand what those expectations are. Lack of a recognition program that promotes employee involvement. The biggest part of a successful safety program, lockout program, is employee involvement. When you have a workforce that is that actively participates in identifying opportunities for improvement, identifying hazards, um, uh, stopping work when they when they see something that's unsafe, having a safety conversation with a coworker or a contractor when they see something uh, unsafe, a positive conversation with them to get them to, to change their behavior um, really starts giving them ownership uh, ownership in that program. Accountability is uh, is another one. Not having clear and defined uh, a clear and defined accountability program that's understood and and and, and enforced. You know, definitely watch out for, for certain things. One is uh, uneven accountability, focusing on, you know, just the, you know, the frontline employees, you know, just focusing on the, the authorized employees and, and uh, not addressing, you know, the behavior and the issues with the supervisors and management. 
because a lot of times it's not, you know, the the uh, the frontline authorized employees. There's a reason um, why they did what they did. Um, so you got to make sure that you have definitely have a, a, a nice, good, robust program, but there's definitely big gaps out, out there in industry, and that is one of the challenges. Uh, but definitely to go uh, dig a little deeper. And then also making sure that uh, you're not giving everyone, anyone a pass on, on some of this stuff, not addressing the, um, you know, I'll call it the, the rock star employee. You know, you put out a new accountability program and everyone gets training and all that. And you definitely, you know, positive reinforcement, you know, it, it is always best. But at some points you have to hold someone accountable. But by God, our best employee just got caught doing something. You know, we're going we're gonna to push that under the rug. Um, that, that's definitely going to disengage um, your employees and, uh, and uh, not going to get good results with that. We don't uh, we don't have the time. Is the the next one? Your know, workplace uh, pressure to to get the job done can lead to shortcuts and at risk behavior. Everyone feels pressure on their jobs to to one level or another. Especially when you're talking about authorized employees and you're talking about lockout tagout, there can be significant significant pressure. Um, out there for for these uh, for these employees, you know they're in the heat of the moment. They have machine down. They have to you know get this piece of equipment up and going. There's millions and dollars millions of dollars you know being flushed down the toilet because the product is not coming off the end of that line. Um, so the pressure can be real. It can be uh, it can be very very high pressure with some of these employees. Um, sometimes this pressure causes employees to put themselves at risk. To get the job done, you know, to satisfy management, to satisfy that pressure, you know, in the heat of the moment, um, sometimes safety can be compromised. This pressure can be real, and it can also be perceived. But leaders have to be careful to ensure the workforce knows that safety should never be compromised. The worst thing a supervisor can do is to turn a blind eye at that at-risk behavior to achieve a desired result. Uh, you know the, the the rock star, the Superman. You know that you know this reinforces that behavior. Hey man, you got it done. Great. You know I'm going to turn a blind eye. You uh, you know you didn't de-energize the whole thing. Uh, you know because you had to get in there real quick and get it done. But you know you got it done and and everyone's everyone's okay, right? Um, that's just going to reinforce it, and then it's going to get passed down just like it did to Brandon, and then it's just going to become accepted uh, accepted behavior. I don't understand program requirements, uh, you know, lack of program and procedures. There's really no excuse for this, but it's so common uh, out in industry. Um, you know, you have to provide the tools, you know, that we talked about, the, you know, the program, the devices, the locks, um, all the processes. You know, you have to provide the tools, and it has to be, you know, implemented the right way and understood and accepted by, by all, your, all the employees. But it is so common you know, for that, uh, you know, that type of program, the tools just not available um, out there, out there for the employees. And, and there really is no excuse for that. Uh, you know, it's very common for, for training to be a check the box exercise. It's uh, not specific to actual company, you know, there's specific procedures, you know, the generic uh, video, the generic online training, but, you know, hey, we got them training. And, uh, you know, we can check the box. You know, OSHA comes in, they might accept it, they might not. They, they're on a roster, they did it, they passed the test, you're good to go. Um, you know, I've seen all different types of training, but it has to be specific to what they're doing. It has to be specific to your program. You know, when there's no component to gauge the level of understanding, you know, that's, a, that's another uh, common pitfall that, uh, that companies fall into, releasing the employee out into the field without that validation, you know, poor on, onboarding. Um, sustainability, you know, lack of a sustainable system. You know, you spend a lot of time building a robust program, developing all the equipment-specific procedures, buying all the necessary equipment, providing the training to the authorized and uh, and affected employees. But then what happens? You know, the the focus shifts to the next problem. Over time, machines move, new equipment's brought in. Uh, employees leave, new employees come in, you know, they're hired, and all that hard work starts to, starts to slip away. And, uh, you know, then th that causes you start to lose buy-in um, from, uh, from the employees. And before you know it, you're, you're back where you started. The gray areas, uh, another big one when we talk about not understanding program requirements, there are many gray areas 
uh, you know, those on the on the call here in the safety profession, we all know there are many, many gray areas in, in safety, and, and especially lockout, tagout is, is no exception. Gray areas like, uh, you know, abusing the, the minor servicing exemption or testing and positioning, uh, you know, troubleshooting can, can lead to significant at-risk behavior that, that becomes just the way we, we work and is, and is accepted uh, because it's not addressed the, the right way. I can't tell you how many times I've heard personally, uh, you know, when we talk about lockout, tagout, well, I was troubleshooting. Um, you know, well, you're in the, you know, the point of operation, um, you know, right by it, well, I had to, I was, I was troubleshooting, you know, but you can never expose yourself, put yourself in harm's way. Uh, you know, there has to be alternative measures that you're going to use to protect yourself. Employees need to understand, fully understand these gray areas and, uh, and when to ask for help. When they get into a situation like that saying, hey, I need help. We need another set of eyes to come in here, and they need to be part of that solution. Okay, so that was uh, the, the four, you know, the, the, the four big, you know, things that, that, that I see out there in industry. Now we're going to, um, you know, we talked about those problems. Let, let's shift a little bit to, you know, uh, now, you know, what do you do? How do you find out your your current state? You know, you have to know what your current state is, and the areas you need to work on. Um, you know, but, but before you put your plan in place, you have to find out where you are. You have to think beyond the, the tools. Again, you know, the procedures, the locks, the tags, the devices. Um, you have to think beyond that. Now, it's very important. You have to make sure you don't skip over that. It's a very, very critical part. You have to have a, a world-class uh, you know, uh, lockout, tagout uh, process with all the required elements in place, you know, 100%, yes, you do, and you have to make sure you're looking at that to make sure you have all the elements in place, but you also have to dig deeper into do the employees understand the program? Do they understand the lockout press, uh, process? How are they applying it out in the field? You can have the best-looking program on paper, but if your employees don't understand it, or they're not uh, they're not applying it out in, in the in the in the in the in the job site. You know, like the the case study with Brandon, the process is failing. So we're we're going to look at uh, three different things. First one here is the the program and, and process elements, and and this is a a compliance review. You know, looking at making sure that you have everything in place. You know, evidence to make sure that you you have the right training records in place. You have a lockout removal process and you have records that back it up. You have equipment specific procedures out there that are posted on the machines that are up to date. Uh, you know, and not taking anyone's word for it. You know, really doing a deep dive, a compliance deep dive into, you know, from A to Z everything. Um, this is just a, a picture of a um, of a bar chart just on, on looking at, you know, the different uh, different categories in, in lockout, tagout, and that first element, that blue bar, is the is the compliance piece. Um, so you 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 have to start with that to make sure all the all the correct elements are are in place. The next one is the the employee understanding. This is you know specific performance questions to a group of uh, diverse employees, your authorized and effective employees that gauge their level of understanding in those same key areas related to the lockout tagout process. You know, um, what are the, the machine specific procedures? How are, you know, where are they located? How do you use them? Um, what do you do if you, uh, you're working on a job and the uh, equipment specific procedure is out of date? What's that management of change process? What devices do you use? Where are they located? Are they available? Uh, what types and, and magnitude of energy are you working with? What are the hazards associated with it? How do you control and isolate that energy? Explain the steps for lockout, tagout. But really, you're doing a, a just to gauge their level of understanding um, of the lockout process. Again, you can have the best looking on paper lockout, tagout program and process. If the employees don't understand it, then it, it, it's not doing any good. Uh, you're quickly going to find. Uh, you know, their level of understanding when you start having these discussions with your employees pretty quick. And then the third piece is the, the application. And the application, this is really go, doing a site review and, uh, and employee observations to verify those specific aspects of the program are being applied appropriately out in the field. Again, you can have a great program, but if they're not doing it out in the field, 
it's uh, you know, it's not working. You know, they can have the, the best understanding of their program also. You can have a great written program. You can have a, a great understanding. They know everything that's in there. The training is good. But when they go out to apply it in the field, they don't do it. Um, so you really have to look at those three different things to get a, a full understanding of your entire lockout process and to really get a good um, current state. You know, for applications, you know, are the procedures available out there in the, in the workplace? You know, hey, do you have written procedures? Yes. Where are they? Well, I don't know. They used to be in the maintenance shop, but not sure. That's probably a problem. Are they following procedure? Are they following the lockout steps? Are they using the right devices out there? Do they know how to use the devices? And are they, you know, securing the right uh, isolation points using the correct devices? So a lot of things you can look at from that standpoint. Wait for that to come up. All right, so once your current state is identified, it's time to put your, your, your action plan in place. Your analysis is only as good as your follow-up. One of the biggest mistakes is letting your action plan fade away until it's forgotten. You know, the action plan needs to be a, a living document with corrective actions, target dates, owners, tied to the business KPIs. You have to keep it visible um, you know, with a certain level of accountability. Um, and that this is for any action plan. Um, we've all been involved, you know, with, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, initiatives and strategies and, and our names on an action plan and it's rah, rah, and we go and, you know, for a month or two and we have meetings and then I couldn't count, you know, on my hands and, and feet how many action plans I've seen just, just fade away. They have to be a living document. They have to be tied to the, to, you know, to the, the, the monthly KPIs, um, and you have to drive it through completion. Um, you know, it can't be one owner trying to drive change for the entire thing. It has to go throughout the organization. It really has to be, um, really has to be embedded. All right, now, now jumping into some of the, the best practices for in, improving behavior safety around your, your lockout program. Uh, you know, we, we already talked about fully understanding your current state. I think we talked a, a lot about that uh, and, and to use that as the foundation to start building, building your, your program. And uh, employees need to, sorry, I'll go up a slide. Employees need to understand that safety is a, is a, priority and should never be be compromised you know employees have the right to stop work and sometimes we talked about that pressure um, and, and that perception as a new employee hey I think I, I should know uh, how to do this uh, I don't want to I don't want to ask the question that's going to go ahead and, and, and do it without fully understanding uh, you know the, the the safe way or or the best way to to do that but employees have to understand that you know it's okay to to stop work, to take a step back, to go to their supervisor, to go to their coworkers, their team lead, and say, you know what, I, I need some help here. I don't feel safe. I don't feel I have the proper understanding. I don't have the right tools uh, to be able to perform this job. Raise your hand and stop work. They have to feel 100% comfortable with that. Um, and then we should praise them for that. You know, hey, thanks for bringing that to my attention. And workplace, workplace uh, pressure does not mean – accepting at-risk behavior. Again, they have to understand that the pressure, because pressure is not going to stop. Uh, pressure is going to, it's always going to be there, but they have to understand that uh, it does not mean they should do something unsafe, um, you know, for the sake of getting more product out the door or saving five minutes of, of downtime or whatever the, whatever the issue might be. They need to understand that, uh, you know, we need to do it the safe way. We need to do it the right way. And uh, you should recognize employees and definitely make sure they are 100% clear um, on that. Don't take it for granted that employees understand. You know, you'd be surprised on, uh, on what you find out going out there and, and interacting with the employees and finding out exactly what they're doing, um, some of the shortcuts that are being made because of that perceived, um, perceived pressure. But you'll make sure they don't uh, perceive that pressure you know, as cutting corners or, or doing something uh, at, that could put themselves at risk.
build your uh, your program based on the specific needs of um, of your of your company. And this is a you know this is a, a another another big one. Um, provide employees with the tools needed to effectively uh, you know com- complete their jobs. Uh, you have to provide those employees with the tools that they need. Uh, they need to com- complete their jobs. If you do not uh, provide the tools, they're, they're not going to be able to, to use those uh, tools and to be able to um, effectively uh, effectively go through and uh, and, and do it. Um, provide uh, the program needs to be accepted by uh, by the workforce. Um, hold on, having a little bit of difficulties here with my screen. One minute. Okay, I am uh, I am back. Here we go. Sorry about that. I was uh, locked up there for a minute. Okay, so get your employees involved. Um, implement an employee participation program that encourages employees to identify and uh, and report safety hazards. You know, uh, the stop work interventions, the near misses, the safety suggest suggestions. How can they help improve uh, the, the lockout program? Stopping. Uh, uh, at-risk behavior on themselves and uh, and others when they see it. You know, get them involved in recommending improvements to the system. Uh, they they need to have a, a, a there needs to be a system to track and provide feedback to the employees. Uh, the thing you can't do is to ignore employees for their participation and wanting to help proactively uh, with the program. You need to embrace. And uh, and recognize that, provide that feedback back to the employees. Uh, a recognition program, you know, needs to be implemented that recognizes them for their proactive efforts, not focus slow solely on just not being injured. Um, uh, involve them in the program development and let them participate in solutions. You know, for the, the the gray areas we talked about. You know, first they have to feel comfortable bringing up the gray areas to. To your attention, you know that they encounter out there in, in their everyday, uh, when they're in their everyday work tasks. You know, in, involving them in developing a solution uh, for that. There's no better way to gain buy-in uh, for your workforce and to get them involved in uh, in developing in developing those solutions. So for the minor servicing um, that can be abused sometimes for the troubleshooting. You know, I need to get in here. I need to get into this hazard zone because I have to observe. Uh, something working, getting them involved, uh, ma- making sure that they, uh, you know, they know when to raise their hand and say, you know, that's not right. You know, we have to take a look at this. We have to do a risk analysis. Um, very, very, very critical, um, but no, no better way. And then uh, watch out for forced engagement. Forced engagement is when you have an employee participation program um, that's implemented and, uh, and you make a, a, a requirement or you have a, a quota for uh, an employee out there saying that, hey, you have to submit five hazards or you have to, you know, have five stop work interventions or you have to have five or ten safety suggestions every week. It becomes more of a, uh, you know, a quota for for those employees and uh, that's going to drive them away from that program. It needs to be open. It needs to be voluntary. That's the only way you're going to get a a true in, engagement on uh, you know on what your uh, what your employees and, and really how engaged they are out there uh, out there in the workplace. So um, definitely watch out watch out for forced engagement. Training is uh, is absolutely absolutely critical. You know from from the upfront the start with the the new hire orientation, uh, mentoring program, refresher training, toolbox talks. But making sure that they fully understand, uh, you know, their role with lockout tackle, and it has to be site specific. There's nothing better than employee mentoring. Just don't release them out into the workforce. Um, you know, here's your tool belt. Here's a couple locks. Go out and uh, and do your job. You have to have that validation in place. Um, so it needs to be specific. You have to have a way to validate their their understanding, and you have to keep it fresh. Um, making sure that you're keeping it out the, out there in front of them through through toolbox talks annual training, refresher courses, things like that. 
again, definitely specific down to the job task level, and uh, you have to have a robust system for, for tracking from a sustainability, uh, a sustainability standpoint. All right, uh, get leadership involved. You know, the best time spent for managers and supervisors is out in the field, interacting with their employees. That's the only way to truly understand, uh, you know, what they're dealing with and, and the struggles that the, those, those authorized uh, employees face. You know, do they have everything de-energized and locked out uh, appropriately? Have they identified and, and mitigated the, the risk to, uh, to an acceptable level? Um, very, very critical. You know, don't sit behind a desk all day. Get out there and interact with the employees. There is absolutely nothing better to truly understand what their struggles are and and uh, to help them to help them through that. And listen to them, you know. And hey, there's an issue with this machine. I'm not sure if we can fully de-energize it. You have to work through that together. But uh, you know, the worst thing is definitely to ignore them or, or really to not go out there and interact with those employees. All right, uh, that was the presentation. Back to you, Kyle. Great. Thank you much, Scott. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, before we start the q and I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. Uh, the survey should be appearing on your screen and that we ask uh, that you consider completing it to let us know your thoughts. Your input is important. It, it goes to directly uh, improving future webcasts, so I hope you please take the time to fill out the survey. If you don't see the evaluation survey on your screen, uh, please turn off your pop-up blocker. All right, uh, let's get to some questions. Um, could you, Scott, could you provide some examples uh, uh, or some more examples of forced employee engagement? Um, you know, when I talk about forced employee engagement, it's it's tied to uh, you know an employee participation. Uh, you know, program of getting those employees engaged in uh, identifying uh, workplace, identifying correct in workplace hazard, uh, hazards, um, getting them to feel comfortable uh, stopping work on themselves or fellow coworkers or contractors, um, you know, and to really be involved, you know, with the safety program. And again, and I said the voluntary thing. Um, what companies, they, they fall into the, the habit or the pitfall of doing is, they always want more. They want more uh, employees submitting um, hazards and, and recommendations and safety suggestions and all that, and they end up putting a, a quota or a goal or something where it's you have to submit so many per week. And I've seen programs start the right way where it, it's open and it's kind of voluntary, and that gives you a clear understanding on, you know, here's who's participating, you know, here's who's not, here's maybe where we need to focus. But then it gets, it gets to become a game where departments are, are trying to beat each other out in different areas, and, and then all of a sudden that you have to submit, you know, 20 hazards, um, you know, in a in a month or suggestions to improve whatever the, the safety program might be, and uh, it really dilutes the program. It uh, you know it causes the employees to start uh, submitting the same oil on the floor, and you really lose sight of of where that true. Uh, participation or that true engagement is uh, with, with your workforce when you really start, uh, you know, pushing the numbers game. So that's what I mean by forced engagement. Okay. So, so what are some ways that, that uh, supervisors and managers can encourage buy-in uh, to a lockout safety program? You know, from, uh, from my experience, uh, you know, definitely uh, you have to get leadership on board, you know, uh, no, I mean, you know, priority number one, uh, make sure the, the employees know that the, the organization is, is fully committed, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to them and uh, to the lockout program, getting the employees involved in, in improving the program. So if you're building it from the ground up or you're doing your, uh, your gap analysis and you have to get your current state, you know, get them involved with that, but definitely get them involved with that action plan and, and, and starting to build it going forward. You have to gather their voice, um, you know, those employees, those frontline employees that are out there living it. Um, you need to get mm -hmm. them involved. Do not build that program, um, you know, in, the, in a bubble. Um, you know, and then the, the mentoring new employees, getting, getting them involved in that, bringing the new authorized employees on board and, and uh, showing them the way, showing them the right, the right way. Not that, uh, you know, Brandon was shown in the case study where they had to, uh, you know, where he skipped a step based on, uh, 
uh, what he heard from his coworkers, and then mm-hmm. definitely starting an employee participation program that uh, that we just discussed. Getting the employees to you know start being their brothers and sisters keeper and uh, recognition and and very very important. Uh, you know, last but not least, I guess would be follow through. You know, listen to your employees and provide feedback to them and uh, don't ignore them. Great. Uh, do you have any guidance on getting um, lockout tagout uh, executors to ensure? The documenting of lockout tagout uh, is complete and accurate. I'm sorry. Repeat that question. Do Do you have any thoughts or guidance on how uh, employers can ensure or can get the lockout tagout executors, the the folks who are supposed to be locking and tagging out? Um, how can you ensure that they're documenting uh, that the lockout tagout is complete and accurate? Oh, when they're actually out there performing their job, if it's yeah. complete or accurate, authorized employees. Um, you know, there, a lot of companies do kind of a um, a permit process or a uh, 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 kind of a check process where they go and they make sure that they identify and they follow, you know, from uh, from step one to, uh, you know, the last step. And uh, it's a validation thing that's signed off by the, the supervisor. Um, you know, that's on the, the extreme side, but that's very common um, out, in, uh, out in industry, you know, included in the work order process uh, you know, where it's, you know, definitely embedded. Um, in their in their job procedures, where lockout is just one of the steps that they're following um, with the entire job uh, that they're completing, and and also going out and and getting out on the floor and interacting with your employees. I mean, there's nothing better than to get out there to validate if your employees are following the right process is to go out there and check. You know, not an announced check. Go out there when they're in the middle of a job and uh, see what they're doing. You know, paperwork can be can be fudged and you know and all that stuff nothing uh, nothing beats going out there on the floor interact with the employees face to face okay great now, now you had mentioned before some you know some of the folks who you know cut corners and you gave some reasons as to why they may not be following the procedures but you know, what are some of the methods to transform the thinking of operators or maintenance employees uh, who don't always follow the lockout pr- the process? Um, how can we change their their mind of thinking to 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 get them to start following that process? Then, right. I mean, you know, you have to make it real. You have to make it real um, with them. You know, there's a lot of different behavior based safety. You know, uh, you know, trainings and 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 things out there. But you have to relate to them. Um, you know, get them to understand that. You know, the 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 example or the the story I gave. Um, the employees down at the, you know, the one guy, you know, hit the button and killed his, his best friend, you know, it can happen. Um, you know, you can do something, you know, a certain way for a long time. It just takes one time where, where something happens, but you have to get them to understand. Uh, you have to make it real. You know, they, they have to have a personal commitment um, to it, but that's not easy. You know, it's, a, it's kind of a million dollar question, you know, to get, get someone to, to change their behavior and change their, their, their thinking. Every, every program I've been involved with, it's a continual process, um, continual process. And, uh, you know, the, the one thing to get them to, um, you know, commit and, and to change is, you know, to get them uh, to participate, you know, in the, in the program and in the program change. And then also getting them to believe and participate in the employee, you know, instituting an employee participation program and, uh, you know, really getting them involved. But, you know, it's uh, not, not an easy question, but. Is is there is there a place um, for discipline if, if if an employer has followed all the steps um, and has, has has attempted to get employee buy-in um, and then some some workers for whatever reason um, you know aren't you following the procedure um, is there a point where where you have to use discipline when it, when it comes to this. There is, and you know, when you talk about you know behavior safety, when it's to lock out, tag out, it's always you want the positive reinforcement. You want the employees looking after one another. You want the employees to have a positive safety conversation when they see a a coworker or a contractor doing something unsafe to get them to change their behavior. And you don't want them to be fearful of of having those conversations. Like if I have this conversation, I tell somebody they're going to get fired. You know, mm-hmm. you want that to be active. You want them. Uh, you want them looking out for one another. You want them having those positive conversations. But there's also the flip side. When you have someone that th- there's just not changing, um, especially when it comes to lockout, tagout, where it is, it is, you know, life and death, and there's, you know, blatant violations. 
of course, you, you have to have uh, disciplinary procedures, progressive discipline. You know, that's the accountability piece. That that has to be a component in your program. So the answer is yes. Would would that accountability um, go from go up the chain though? Uh, would, would it? You know, uh, we were kind of talking. I think um, as it pertains to you know the, the floor workers, but does that accountability um, and that discipline uh, hold true for you know the managers or the supervisors? Um, and on up. Oh, absolutely. That's a that's a great question. So you know, a lot of times it's really easy to say, hey, it's the it's the employee. They did something unsafe, so we're gonna, uh, you know, we're gonna you know discipline those employees. When it's it goes way deeper than that. You know, it's the, the mm-hmm. it's the whole process. It's the supervisors that are directing um, the the employee to do that, or there's a lack of training. Um, um, you know, that that's the way they were trained to do it. Um, a lot of different reasons there so every everyone has to be you know looked at and investigated you know fully uh, because a lot of times what you'll find out it's not that frontline employee there's other reasons why um, they did what they did and uh, and those employees supervisors managers should be held just as as, as is accountable accountable as that frontline authorized employee so yes okay great thank you um, we had a question here about ownership um, how can you go about empowering employee ownership of safety suggestions rather than turning it into, um, you know, workers going to the safety professional and saying, I have a problem, I need you to fix it. And this is something I've, I've heard brought up by other safety professionals where, you know, workers seem to think it's the safety pro's responsibility to fix everything. Um, so is there a right. way to go about um, empowering ownership uh, among employees uh, regarding safety suggestions instead of them just constantly going to the safety pro as a Mr. Fix-It? Yeah, that can happen a lot, and you can easily become uh, overwhelmed. And, you know, this, this is the biggest thing, how you get ownership um, with those employees. You, you have to involve them, you know. You know, it can start with the safety committee, you know, uh, putting them in charge of reviewing the, the, the suggestions and, and uh, prioritizing them and, and, uh, and actually um, – you know, uh, helping complete and, uh, you know, and, and get through some of those, um, you know, participate and talk about lockout tag out, you know, participate in the, uh, you know, the, the annual, um, equipment procedure reviews, you know, getting them involved, uh, participate in developing the procedures, uh, getting them out on the floor and, uh, and participating in, uh, addressing the, the gray areas when we talk about, uh, lockout tag out on, on, you know, cause no, there's no one better than, than those folks, especially with lockout tag out, those authorized employees, um, you know, to, to make a change and to identify what works and what doesn't. Um, but you really have to uh, push back and, and empower the employees to make that change. I think sometimes you don't, uh, they're on too much of a short leash, uh, safety committees and, and things. We, we don't let them um, kind of make change and, and that. And I think you need to empower that group of employees to say, you know, hey, no, we're going to give you the uh, uh, the power, the leeway, the resources, uh, you know, to take a shot at it yourself. You know, and safety can always be there as a resource. Safety is a resource, um, but really empower them to uh, to take the lead and make that change. Well, what about helping employees out when it comes to just remembering lockout tag out? You know, they've had the training, they've been told to do it. Um, what can employers do or managers do? Uh, to help employees to remember to apply their lockout tag out? Gosh, I mean, a lot of things. Uh, you know, shift change um, meetings, you know, lockout, especially with the, the authorized, it, it should, uh, I guess if you can't become, uh, I guess it can become complacent because, you know, they're, they're dealing with it, uh, they're dealing with it all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, ticklers, the, the, the uh, you know, a lot of um, CMMSs and, and uh, you know, work order management systems and, and things having lockout uh, lockout front and center. Um, you know, the paperwork thing. You know, that 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 doesn't solve anything. But really having it uh, having it front of mind and you know and, and talking about it. You know, with the the shift change procedures and uh, and employees and, and always keeping it uh, keeping it out front. You know, make sure you got uh, you know visuals out there when they're working on the machines with their visual equipment uh, specific procedures with the energy isolation points identified, um, not making it too hard for employees to participate in lockout tagout. You know, do they have personal locks or they have to go back to a, 
uh, the shop somewhere to check out every time they're going to be uh, working on a machine. Are the devices readily available? Um, you know, don't make it too hard on the employees. You have to make it, you know, it, it's, it's part of their, their everyday job normally. Um, you know, don't make it too difficult on them. Okay. I, I want to go back real quick to uh, <clears throat> discipline a little bit. Um, in, in your mind, when, when, we, when we get to that point um, where, where the, the procedure is not being followed for, for X, Y, and Z, um, do you think zero tolerance programs or kind of a progressive disciplinary actions are more effective for employee accountability for non-compliant incidents? We're not compliant when they do something blatant and, uh, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, it's pretty clear, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've been involved with, um, I've been involved with on, on both sides. Um, you know, the, the prog progressive discipline, of course, but there's always kind of the, you know, the big ones that uh, if you do, it's, it's life and death. And, um, you know, I've, I have been uh, in favor of, you know, when it is, something that's very significant, uh, like uh, lockout, tagout, depending on what they did and, and, the, and the violation, uh, you mm -hmm. know, confined space entry, fall protection, um, you know, and if it truly is down and, and uh, you know, it is a, um, you know, someone's decision and they, they truly did that at-risk behavior and that violation, that, you know, it depends, but zero tolerance does have its place in some of those more significant um, significant violations. You know, we, we talked quite a bit about employee ownership and, and accountability here, but regarding management, what's the best way to get them to buy into the program? Because again, you know, oftentimes there, there can be this confrontation between, um, you know, safety and productivity. And, and you, in your story earlier that you, you mentioned, you know, the, the, the new guy that comes in and he's told he's going too slow, he's got to pick it up. Um, and as a result, he doesn't follow the procedure and he gets hurt. So how can you get management to, to buy into the program? You know, that, that, that can be, uh, you know, it can be difficult, but you got to get them to, to participate and in, in definitely in the program. One, they have to have a full understanding of, uh, you know, of the program and the expectations. And, uh, you know, sometimes they're, they're not aware of, um, you know, the, the, lockout tag out and the time it takes and you know when they're um pressuring their employees get the machine up get the machine up you know why is it taking 10 minutes and they don't understand you know what steps need to happen to be able to work on that machine safely getting them up to speed to fully understand that um so it's not always a you know um, a screaming match when a, when a machine goes down and then every time after you know the job is done it's uh here's why we did it normally that they understand when it's mm -hmm. all said and done but yeah we had to get uh lock it out or get the right equipment or whatever the case might be but to get them fully aware of uh of the program and the expectations and to also get them involved you know get them out there get them to interact with the employees get them to understand what they go through on a, on a day-to-day -day basis um go out there do an observations review uh, reviews with the employees, get get them involved in the inspections um, and different things. But you know, the uh, g getting them the full understanding of what's truly going on and what's really happening um, out in the workforce is a is a big step in the right directions. Because a lot of times they just don't understand those challenges that the employees mm -hmm. face on a day to day basis. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I apologize. There were several questions we didn't get a chance to answer. But uh, rest assured, all of those unanswered questions will be forwarded on to Scott. Uh, once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to offer us your feedback. And that concludes today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Scott, Brady, and all of you who listened in. Thank you, and have a great day.